composite structures combine frame elements and truss elements in one structure. If a composite structure is only one or two degrees indeterminate, the force method can be a very efficient tool for structural analysis. So in this problem, we'll analyze an indeterminate composite structure and we'll use the force method. The key concepts we'll use are calculating the degree of indeterminacy, selecting a redundant for the force method of analysis, and predicting deflection using virtual work. And here's our composite structure. We have a beam cantilevered from the wall, and at the far end, B, it's supported by a rod. We're to find the reactions at A and the force in the tie rod. Both pieces of the composite structure are made of steel, so we have the modulus of elasticity, we have the moment of inertia for the beam, and we have the cross-sectional area for the tie rod. Since the cross-sectional area of the beam will be much larger than that of the tie rod, we're going to neglect any axial deformation in the beam. Now our approach. We'll start by approximating the answer. Before we perform lengthy calculations to predict the reactions at A and the force in the tie rod, let's estimate what those reactions will be so that we have something to compare to at the end in order to verify we have reasonable results. Then we're ready to start the force method. We'll first find out how many degrees indeterminate so that we can to figure out how many redundants we need. We'll select those redundants and write equations of compatibility. Then we're ready to release the structure, the composite structure, from its redundant. We'll call that the primary structure. We need to predict deflection of that primary structure. due to the applied load in this case the applied load is the 50 kilonewtons down on the beam then we'll be ready to predict deflection of the primary structure due to a unit redundant. And we repeat step four for as many redundants as we have. Once we've done that, step five will be find the redundants. Once we've done that, with step six, we'll use equilibrium to find the remaining support reactions. Then step seven, we'll compare with our approximation and evaluate whether we have a reasonable result.
Let's begin. Step 1. We're going to approximate the answer. As we look at this structure, we have fixed support at A, and vertical displacement is restrained somewhat at B, so this is sort of like the following situation with the 50 kilonewton force acting halfway across the beam with a vertical reaction at B, a vertical reaction at A, and a moment reaction at A. Now, although we've not discussed it in the textbook yet, if you peek inside the back cover, of our text, you'll see a variety of beam situations. Some fixed on both ends, some fixed on one end, roller supported on the other, with a variety of different loadings. So if we look at fixed at one end, roller at the other, point load exactly in the middle, we have this situation and the moment reaction at the fixed end will be 3 times the point force times the span length divided by 16. So we have, by formula, the moment reaction at A. Now notice in the back cover of our book, the moment is drawn counterclockwise. We drew ours clockwise, so it'll be a minus 3 times the force, the span length over 16, which equals a minus 3 times 50 kilonewtons, span length of 4 meters, divided by 16, is a minus 37.5 kilonewton meters. Now let's apply equilibrium to this free body. to find the vertical reactions. If I sum moments about point B, I get to choose the direction to, of positive for the summation, and so I will choose clockwise as positive because it'll make my bookkeeping easier. We have a positive MA, which is a negative quantity, so we have a negative 37.5 kilonewton meters. AY causes a positive rotation about B through 4 meters, and the 50 kilonewtons causes a negative rotation through 2 meters. We solve for AY and find that it's a positive 34.4 kilonewtons. and we had drawn it up so our result would be up. We'll then sum forces in the y direction or the vertical direction. We'll choose up as positive for our summation. We have the vertical reaction at A which is a positive 34.4. We have the downward applied load and we have an assumed upward reaction at B. We'll solve for the reaction at B and find it's a positive 15.6. So we predict through this approximation that it will be up as drawn. Now how about the tie rod?
if we look at the force resultant in the tie rod, we'll see that it has a vertical component which must be fifteen point six kilonewtons the vertical reaction at B. Based on the geometry of our problem we have a three, four, five describing the slope of the force in BC so three-fifths of the force in the tie rod will equal the 15.6 kilonewtons so the force in the tie rod we predict will be 26.0 kilonewtons and that is in tension now the last part is the horizontal reaction if we look at the beam we have the unknown horizontal reaction AX we have our force in the tie rod which has a horizontal component and the force in the tie rod is 26.0 kilonewtons so if I sum forces in the horizontal direction we'll choose to the right as positive we have the unknown reaction at A minus four-fifths of the force in the tie rod So the horizontal reaction at A we predict to be 20.8 kilonewtons in the direction drawn. So based on our approximation we now have predictions of all the reactions. Now we're ready to start the force method. Step two. We're going to figure out how many degrees in determinant so we can choose our redundance and write equations of compatibility indeterminacy let's see we have horizontal reaction at A vertical reaction at A, moment reaction at A, and a reaction at C that will follow the line or the axis of the tie rod. So we have four unknown support reactions. We'll subtract the number of free bodies, one, number of equations of equilibrium per free body, three, and that gives us one degree indeterminate, which means we need to choose one redundant. And in this case, let's make it the force in the tie rod. We can choose any internal force or any support reaction as long as the resulting structure, the primary structure, the structure with the redundant removed is determinate and stable. Then we want to create or write our equation of compatibility. To do that, let's consider that the real structure, the indeterminate structure, is a linear combination of 
of two situations. One of them, the primary structure with the applied load. And so if we're looking, if we're going to consider the force in member BC, the tie rod, as the redundant, when we cut it there, we'll get an opening. We'll superimpose that with again the primary structure. So cut in member BC, the tie rod. will amplify this situation by the magnitude of force in member BC and will apply a unit redundant at the cut and that will cause an overlap that we'll call F at degree of freedom BC due to a unit redundant applied at BC and that's our flexibility coefficient. So our equation of compatibility becomes delta BC plus the unknown force in the tie rod BC times the flexibility coefficient all of that must add up to zero. Now step three. We need to start calculating the deflections from those pictures we drew of the primary structure. And so let's begin by predicting deflection of the primary structure which has a cut in the tie, BC, due to the applied load. So with this load acting on the beam and the tie rod cut, there will open a gap, delta BC. And that's what we want to calculate. To do that, we're going to need to use virtual work. Since it's a composite structure. Double integration, moment area, conjugate beam, none of those methods would work for our composite structure. So let's start by finding the internal loads due to the real load applied to the structure. So as we consider what is happening in our composite structure subjected to the 50 kilonewton concentrated force. We can see that the axial force in the tie rod due to this applied load is going to be zero. Now for the beam, we're going to need to use two equations to describe moment. I'll start my first coordinate system at end B, working my way in. Then I'll start my second coordinate system at the concentrated force, working my way back to point A. And so let's draw our first free body by cutting within the range of x1. 
your body diagram. Cut an X1. We know the axial force in the tie rod is zero. The length of the piece is X1. We have an unknown shear as a function of X1 and an unknown moment as a function of X1. So let's some moments about the cut. Since the unknown moment is drawn clockwise, I'll choose clockwise to be positive in my summation. And the only contributor is the unknown moment. So my equation for moment in the range of x1 is the constant 0. Now let's move into the, the range of x2. So we'll cut it somewhere in there. Draw a free body diagram of the right piece. This part is 2 meters long. We know that there is zero force in the tie rod. We have the 50 kilonewton applied force. The unknown shear is a function of x2. And the unknown moment as a function of x2 and a distance x2 from the force to the cut. Let's sum moments at the cut. Again, I'll choose clockwise as positive for my summation. I have a positive contribution from the unknown moment at the cut. And we have a positive contribution from the concentrated force acting through a distance of x2. So the equation of moment in the range of x2 is a minus 50 kilonewtons x2. Now we need to find the internal loads due to the virtual force. If you remember, our primary structure is cut at the tie rod. We have the beam. We have regions labeled X1 and X2. Our virtual force is applied at the cut so that we can predict the displacement at this point of the two ends that at the cut. As we look at this free body, we see that the normal force in the tie rod is plus one. Now let's draw a free body diagram. Cut in the range of x1, say there, we have a piece x1 long with the tie rod and the virtual force our unknown shear as a function of x1 and our unknown moment as a function of x1. Remember that from the geometry of our problem. This is a 3, 4, 5. Let's sum moments about the cut. choose clockwise as positive. I have the unknown 
moment at x1. And I have a negative contribution from the virtual force. It's 3 fifths of the force in the tie rod. And that acts through a distance x1. So my equation of moment in the beam along x1 is a positive 0 0.6 x1. Now to cut it in x2, we know that this is a 3, 4, 5 angle to it, 2 meters to the point where the concentrated force acted, x2 to the end, our virtual force acting on the end, the cut end of the tie rod, our unknown shear as a function of x2, and our unknown moment as a function of x2. Let's sum moments about the cut. choose clockwise as positive. We have a positive contribution from the unknown moment at the cut. We have a negative contribution from the vertical part of the tie rod force, so negative three-fifths times the tie rod force of one, which acts through a distance of x2 plus two meters we solve that to get an equation for moment along the region of x2 of a positive 0.6 x2 plus 1.2 meters. Now we have sufficient information to use virtual work to calculate the deflection along the cut here. Remember we drew our virtual force stretching the tie rod, which means a positive deflection means an overlap. So if we go to our virtual work formula, we'll need to sum the virtual normal force times the real normal force times the length of the member over AE for the member and we'll sum the integral over the length of the member the virtual moment times the real moment over EI for the member integrated with respect to X for this composite structure that has been cut at the tie rod, so our primary structure, we saw that our virtual normal force was 1 and the real normal force was 0. So we have the normal force, virtual normal force times the real normal force so this contribution will be zero, but I'm going to write it out anyway. So that we can see, normally it would contribute. To which we'll integrate over the range of x1. So from zero to two meters, the moment equation due to the virtual force in the range of x1 is 0.6 x1 and due to the applied load, the real load, it's 0. So we have 0.6 x1 
x1 times 0. So this product will be 0. Which means this definite integral will be 0. And to which we add the integral over x2. Our virtual moment is given here, and our real moment is minus 50 kilonewtons times x2. So we have 0 0.6 x2 plus 1.2 meters times minus 50 kilonewtons x1 excuse me, x2, integrated with respect to x2, all over E, I, and the moment of inertia is for the beam AB. Well, that last term is not going to be 0. Let's multiply the two equations together. We get minus 30 kilonewton x2 squared minus 60 kilonewton meters times x2 all over E and I integrated with respect to x2. So let's integrate this polynomial the exponent increases by 1 and then we divide. So we have a minus 30 kilonewton x2 cubed over 3e e i minus this exponent increases and then we divide so a 60 kilonewton meter x2 squared over 2 EI. All of this evaluated at the limits from 0 to 2 meters. So that equals minus 30 kilonewtons, 2 meters cubed over 3 EI minus. 60 kilonewton meters times 2 meters squared over 2 EI. And we'll subtract out when we put the 0 in, we get a minus 0. Put all of those together, we get a minus 200 kilonewton meter cubed over E. I. And so now let's substitute in for our modulus of elasticity and our moment of inertia. We had the minus or we have the minus 200 kilonewton meter cubed in the numerator. The moment of inertia is 200 gigapascals, which can be written as 200 times 10 to the 6 kilonewtons per meter squared moment of inertia 55 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the fourth so we have meters to the fifth in the numerator let's convert that to millimeters so we need to raise that to the fifth put all of those together we get a negative 18.18 millimeters. Right? And since it's negative, it means it's not overlapping. It's creating a gap, which is what we expected. Step four. is to find deflection of the primary structure
due to a unit redundant. So we take off the applied force. It's the primary structure, so it's cut in, in the tie BC. And we apply a unit redundant. But this looks exactly like the situation we had for the virtual force in the previous calculations. So our virtual work expression to find this overlap if it's a positive quantity is a summation of the virtual normal forces we found before squared times the length of the respective members over AE for each of the members plus the summation of the integral over the lengths, the virtual moments that we had found before squared over EI integrated with respect to the length. So we have, for a virtual normal force, we had found it to be plus one square that. The length of member BC 5 meters over AE. Then we'll integrate over the length X1 the moment we had found to be an equation of 0.6 times x1 we'll square that divide it by EI integrate with respect to x1 we'll integrate over the range of x2 the virtual moment we found to be 0.6 x2 plus 1.2 meters We'll square that equation, divide by EI, integrate with respect to X2. And that gives us 5 meters over AE plus the integral from 0 to 2 meters of 0.36 X1 squared over EI. We'll integrate with respect to X1. An integral from 0 to 2 meters of 0.36 X2 squared plus 1.44 meters X2 plus 1.44 4, 4 meters squared. Integrate all of that with respect to x2 and it is divided by EI. So all of that equals 5 meters over AE plus to integrate this polynomial we raise the power and then divide by the new power so we have 0.36 x1 cubed over 3 EI and this I is for the beam AB evaluated from 0 to 2 meters to which we add raise this power and divide 
point three six x two cubed over three. We raise this power and divide one point four four meters over two x two squared. And then we add an x two to this one. And since the new exponent is one, when we divide by one we just get the same term. All of these divided by E I and the moment of inertia is the same as it was for the other segment, evaluated at the limits from zero to two meters. When we evaluate these at the limits, we get 0.12 times two meters cubed divided by EI minus a zero, to which we add a point one two times two meters cubed plus point seven two meters times two meters squared plus one point four four meters squared times two meters. All of these terms divided by EI, and we subtract this polynomial evalu evaluated at the lower limit, which is a minus zero. We have five meters over AE plus 0.96 meters cubed over EI plus a 6.72 meters cubed over EI. Now we're ready to substitute in for E, A, and I. We have the five meters over the 600 millimeter squared cross-sectional area of the tie rod. The modulus elasticity, 200 gigapascals, which is 200 times 10 to the 6 kilonewton per meter squared. To get consistent units, we'll take the meter squared times the meter and we'll convert those all to millimeters. So we cube that and we add to it the 0.96 and the 6.72 which gives us 7.68 meters cubed over the modulus of elasticity 200 times 10 to the 6 kilonewton per meter squared times the moment of inertia of the beam, 55 times 10 to the sixth millimeters to the fourth. So we have meters squared times meters cubed. We have meters to the fifth. Let's convert those all to millimeters. And so we have 0 0.042 millimeters per kilonewton is the contribution from the normal force in member BC and a 0.698 millimeters per kilonewton is the contribution from bending in the beam AB. So a combined 0 0.740 millimeters per kilonewton. It is a positive quantity, which means 
when the redundant is tension, we get an overlap. After all of those calculations, we are finally ready for step five, which is to find the redundant. Our equation of compatibility we found to be the deflection or the gap opening in tie rod BC plus the unknown axial force in member BC times the flexibility coefficient have to add up to zero. And we had found delta BC to be a negative 18.18 millimeters due to the applied 50 kilonewton concentrated force on the beam acting on the primary structure to which we add our unknown force in member BC times the flexibility coefficient which we found to be 0.74 millimeters per kilonewton. And those two have to add up to zero. So the force in member BC is a positive 24.6 kilonewtons. And since we drew our redundant as pulling on the ends of the cut and we get a positive, it means it is pulling on the ends of the cut, the force in the tie rod is tension. Now step six. We're going to find the remaining support reactions. So we have a y, a x, the moment reaction at a, and we know that the reaction at c is 24.6 kilonewtons pulling on the end of the tie rod in tension. And so this slope is 3, 4, 5. Let some forces in the horizontal direction choose to the right as positive. We have the unknown reaction at A minus the horizontal contribution from the reaction at C which is minus four-fifths times the 24.6 kilonewtons. And so the horizontal reaction at A we find to be a positive 19.7 kilonewtons. We drew it to the right. So it is to the right. Now let's sum forces in the vertical direction. We'll choose up as positive. We have the unknown vertical reaction at A minus the applied 50 kilonewton load plus the vertical component of the reaction at C. So plus three-fifths times 24.6 kilonewtons. Solve that for AY and we get a positive 35.2 kilonewtons 
we had drawn it up so it does act in the upward direction. Now let's sum moments about point A. I'll choose clockwise as positive. So we have a positive contribution from the moment reaction at A, a positive contribution from the applied 50 kilonewton force acting through 2 meters. We have a negative contribution from the vertical part of the tie rod force acting out at B. So minus 3 fifths times 24.6 kilonewtons acting through 4 meters. We solve that for the unknown moment reaction at A and find a negative 41.0 kilonewton meters it is not clockwise as we had originally drawn it. Now let's compare our force method results with our approximate results. We had found through our approximation we expected the horizontal reaction at A to be approximately 20.8 kilonewtons acting to the right. From the force method we obtained 19.7 kilonewtons acting to the right. Those two are reasonably close. For our vertical reaction at A, our approximate result was 34.4 kilonewtons acting upward. And from the method we found 35.2 kilonewtons acting up. Those are also reasonably close. For the moment reaction at A, our approximation was a negative 37.5 kilonewton meters. So not clockwise as we originally drew it. And from the force method, we found a negative 41 kilonewton meters. Also not in the clockwise direction we'd originally drawn. These two quantities are also reasonably close. Now for the force in member BC. Our approximation predicted it to be 26 kilonewtons in tension and the force method gave us 24.6 kilonewtons in tension. Also reasonably close. So by comparing our approximate results with our force method results, we can reasonably conclude that we have a reliable prediction of the reactions at A and the force in the tie rod BC. Now let's go back and review the process we followed. We started by observing that our composite structure with a cantilevered beam 
supported on the end by a tie rod is very similar to a beam that is fixed at one end and roller supported at the other. So we use the information from the inside back cover of our textbook in order to generate the moment reaction for this indeterminate beam that is fixed and roller supported and then used equilibrium to deduce what the other reactions would be. We then calculated the degree of indeterminacy and since it was only one degree indeterminate we needed only one redundant and we chose the axial force in member BC from which we then wrote the equation of compatibility and began calculating the deflection of the primary structure or released structure due to the applied 50 kilonewton load. Needed to use virtual work since it's a composite structure. First we found the internal loads due to the real load acting on the primary structure. We then found the internal loads due to the virtual force acting on the primary structure. We then combined those results in the virtual work formula and predicted the gap in member BC at its cut. To get the flexibility coefficient, we noted that the primary structure with a unit redundant is identical to the primary structure with the virtual force we had used before. So we already had the information we needed to apply virtual work to calculate the flexibility coefficient. We then found the redundant, the internal force in member BC, then used equilibrium to find the remaining support reactions. We then compared those force method results with our approximate results, found that they were in good agreement and concluded that we have a reasonable prediction of the reactions at A and the force in tie rod BC. Well done.